I was born on an island, a small island off of North America's east coast, where the natives spoke hundreds of languages. Needless to say, Manhattan Island was a very stimulating place to grow up, if an overwhelming place to live, with all of the nonstop uh, rush hour traffic and babble of rush hour crowds and day and night construction of new skyscrapers and, of course, the nonstop confusion of tongues. One day, my parents were summoned by the authorities, and they had a meeting with the school psychologist. He said, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Drucker, thank you for coming. Please have a seat. Walked to a filing cabinet, took out a piece of paper. Yes, Mr. and Mrs. Drucker, your son, Eric, drew this. And this. And this. <laughs> so many of these images, I wasn't even making up. I was seeing these. They were in the environment. But this is going to be a recurring motif throughout my life. Killing the messenger, playing the person who brings the message, or the person who's holding up the mirror. So this is when I was about seven or eight years old, and I continued along a similar vein. Coming of age in New York City, it always struck me as I got older that it was very odd that there would be so much loneliness in a city of eight million people. By the time I was a teenager, I think I started to realize that pictures were, in fact, an extremely powerful means of communication. That pictures are a universal language, like music. Universal language, indeed. It also occurred to me that if I was going to continue to make pictures and be an artist as an adult, as a grown-up, grown-up, grown-up artist, it's kind of an oxymoron, no? Grown-up artist. In a sense, an artist never really grows up, not really, nor should he. Uh, it's, it's important to, uh, an artist needs to uh, uh, maintain the ability to see the world through the eyes of a child and really needs to develop a type of x-ray vision in order to see through all the many layers of reality in the city, through all of the layers of illusion.
I realized that the most direct way of communicating, after all, art is simply a language, a means of communication. It's not just about expressing oneself, it's about communicating. That the most direct means of communication would be to print up the artwork as posters and just put them on the streets and poster them all over the neighborhood, which is what I did for years, starting at about the age of 18 or 19 rather than wait uh, to be discovered by some art gallery or some art dealer, just cut to the chase. Take the work directly to the public and post it on the streets of lower Manhattan. As you can see, most of these images are pretty hardcore. They're things that have a lot of emotion and uh, kind of, uh, things that I felt strongly about, things that were happening in the Lower East Side of New York during these years. So I've continued to make street posters, even uh, though I'm getting work published in the mainstream. Putting it in the public eye is the place that artists always forget about. Too often artists ghettoize themselves by hiding out in the galleries. The ultimate gallery is just the streets. The irony is that the corporations are hipper than the artists in this regard. They've known this for years. Don't wait to get discovered, honey. You just put it right out on the street where the public can see you, honey. <laughs> and the artists have gotten all kind of uptight in recent years. The Bohemians are all busy like branding themselves, coming up with their artistic identity and waiting to get into an art museum someday. And they don't realize, no, no, that's after you're dead. The museum, that's simply an archive for your work after you're dead. I was always encouraged by all of the positive feedback I got from the street posters, and it seemed like most people really enjoyed my street art. However, the New York City police had a more critical view, and <laughs> from time to time, I found myself behind bars. It further occurred to me that if a picture can be so powerful, a single image has this much power, then it would follow that a sequence of images might be even more powerful. So my first book called Flood was really an experiment in writing an entire book, like 200 page novel without using any words at all, just letting the pictures do the talking. This is the final chapter of Flood. use words at all. Sometimes you could speak even more powerfully without using any words. Better to use as few syllables as possible. I was riding my bicycle down along the river one winter day, and I noticed that there were these two guys who were camped out here under the Brooklyn Bridge. And I hung out with them for a while, and they shared some of the food that they were cooking. And it was such a, a vivid image that when I got back home to my studio, I started painting an image. It was so clear in my mind, and I thought I had nailed it so well that I thought I was going to print it up as a street poster, although full color is more expensive. I thought, hmm, 
Maybe I'll just take it up to Midtown Manhattan and run it by the folks at the New Yorker magazine. It's a long shot, but I had actually sold them a couple of covers recently. And what, the worst they could do is say no, right? So sure enough, they said, no, no. Eric, it's a very pretty picture, but we can't, uh, can't have homeless people on the cover of the New Yorker magazine. Uh, it, it might be too depressing for our, our readers. Then I had to remind them that you could go down there right now and see for yourself that there are these two New Yorkers camped out down there. <laughs> and to their credit, they did run it on the cover. I was encouraged by this, and I was thinking of the, the New Yorker magazine as almost an extension of the street posters. Most people who see the cover of the New Yorker don't buy the magazine. They don't subscribe to it, but they will see it on the way to work at the newsstand like they would see a poster on the street on the way to work. So here was an image uh, I did about four years ago. It was when the, uh, the cell phone uh, revolution was, had completely gotten out of control and everyone was walking around in the 21st century with these little walkie-talkies. This is before the stock market crash, mind you. I thought, ah, perfect New Yorker cover. It's, it's got humor, it's got everything, slapstick humor even. But they rejected it. They said, no, no, the editor, he said, no, the stock market is really strong right now. They said, should we send it back to you? Or should, and I said, why don't you just hang on to it? Hang on to this image. I'm sure that <laughs> one of these days. And sure enough, about six months later, ring, hello? Yes, uh, this is the New Yorker. This is Eric, yes. You know, the, the image that you uh, left with us? Which one? The one with the, uh, the businessman about to step into the open manhole? I said, yes. Uh, has it been published yet? Because we want to use it for the cover of our next issue. I said, oh, no, no, no. It hasn't appeared anywhere yet. In fact, I was saving this one just for you. <laughs> Often the best ones get rejected, but some of them go through over the years. Again, I just think of them as street posters. It's street art. It ends up on the newsstand. A small minority of the people who see it actually buy the thing, could even afford the cover price these days. So this is perhaps uh, what I'm best known for. This is the most mainstream gig I've got, is uh, doing covers for the New Yorker. And it's led to other things. Like I was recently hired a couple of years ago to work on this film that came out last year. You hear about this? Howl, they made a movie of the famous Allen Ginsberg poem, the epic 20th century poem uh, by the beat poet Allen Ginsberg. I actually knew Allen Ginsberg uh, from my neighborhood, the Lower East Side, Lower Manhattan. I was pretty good friends with him and we had collaborated on a number of projects before the poet died about 15 years ago. So when I was contacted by filmmakers who were making a movie of Howell recently, I, I jumped at it. I said, it'll be like collaborating with my old friend all over again. So this was uh, some uh, animation that I designed for the film. I'm just gonna read a little excerpt. This is Howell part two, and you can see that I'm bouncing off of my images off of Ginsburg's words. So it was a rare opportunity to attempt to translate poetry into another art form, visual art, animation. When this poem was published in the 50s, it was immediately busted. The publisher was thrown in jail. What sphinx of cement and aluminum bashed open their skulls and ate up their brains and imagination? Moloch, solitude, filth, ugliness, ash cans, and unobtainable dollars. Children screaming under the stairways, boys sobbing in armies, old men weeping in the parks. Moloch, Moloch, nightmare of Moloch. Moloch the loveless, mental Moloch, Moloch the heavy judger of men. Moloch the incomprehensible prison, Moloch the crossbone, soulless jailhouse and congress of sorrows, Moloch whose buildings are judgment, Moloch the vast stone of war, Moloch the stunned governments, 
Moloch, whose mind is pure machinery. Moloch, whose blood is running money. Moloch, whose fingers are ten armies. Moloch, whose breast is a cannibal dynamo. Moloch, whose ear is a smoking tomb. Moloch, whose eyes are a thousand blind windows. Moloch, whose skyscrapers stand in the long streets like endless Jehovah's. Moloch, whose factories dream and croak in the fog. Moloch, whose smokestacks and antennae crown the cities. Moloch, whose love is endless oil and stone. Moloch, whose soul is electricity and banks. Moloch, whose poverty is the specter of genius. Moloch, whose fate is a cloud of sexless hydrogen. Moloch, whose name is the mind. Moloch, who entered my soul early. Moloch, in whom I am a consciousness without a body. Moloch, who frightened me out of my natural ecstasy. Moloch, whom I abandon. Wake up in Moloch, light streaming out of the sky. Moloch, Moloch, robot apartments, invisible suburbs, skeleton treasuries, blind capitals, demonic industries, spectral nations, invincible madhouses, granite cocks, monstrous bombs. They broke their backs, lifting Moloch to heaven. Pavements, trees, radios, tons, lifting the city to heaven, which exists and is everywhere about us. Visions, omens, hallucinations, miracles, ecstasies, gone down the American River. Pshh. They bade farewell. They jumped off the roof to solitude, waving, carrying flowers into the river, into the street. <laughs>